So am I? OK, so I should be recording now. Um, all right, so there we go. Uh, thanks, everybody. So we're going to start recording now. I apologize for those that are just getting to the recording um, that we were a little delayed in hearing from Dr. Gary Don from UNS Scotland, but you'll get a chance to hear from her more when we get to the question and answer. Uh, so so all right, let's move forward with. Um, I want to introduce Lucy Hunnett, who's an international program officer at Link Education International. Uh, they also joined us last year under a slightly different name. So, uh, Lucy, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Uh, feel free to take Thank it away. You. Thank you for pointing out the name change as well. We've recently um, yeah, changed our name from Link Community Development to Link Education International to really kind of make it clear that we are uh, an education NGO and have a, a rebrand and a brand new website that you're more than welcome to, to visit as well. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I'm looking forward to sharing more about what LINK does, the specific project that I work on in Malawi, and how we went about adapting to COVID-19, because it's really quite hard to escape, sadly. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, LINK is one of Scotland's leading international education charities. Uh, in some of the poorest rural areas of Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda and Uganda, we work to transform education for children and communities through our four partner organisations. We're the uh, big believer also um, that partnership is absolutely the, the way forward. Um, we focus on enhancing teaching and learning in schools, as well as building up life skills and promoting inclusion for the most marginalised. Our vision is one where all children have access to a good quality education, giving them hope and a strong foundation to build a brighter future. Uh, the next slide, please. LINK provides expert training and support to schools, communities and governments to make quality education a reality for every child. Improving education is not a one off project that can be delivered within a short time frame. It requires change within the education system, within schools and within communities. So we work across these three interconnected areas to make a real and lasting difference. In this way, we enable broad systems change while also meeting the need for more tailored localised support to, to overcome really specific challenges. Um, next slide, please. 2020 began with a lot of promise for us um, in Ethiopia. We started on a new project training school leaders and trialling new approaches to inclusion and community engagement in four regions that were new to us. In Malawi, we were developing our work, helping some of the most vulnerable out of school girls learn foundation and vocational skills. We continued to provide technical support to the Rwandan Education Board, working with governments is one of our key strengths. And in Uganda, we started to work on key recommendations from the informative education system study we completed in 2019. Across the LINK family, progress was really on track to help more children gain a quality education and a brighter future. As COVID-19 continued to spread in the spring of last year, eventually all the schools we work with closed to help keep communities safe. Uh, LINK joined nationwide coordinated emergency responses to try and minimise the impact on learners and support schools through this really difficult time. By the end of the year, all schools were at least partially open again, but faced increased challenges to teaching and learning and needed greater support. And sadly, just like the UK, some countries in sub-Saharan Africa are now experiencing a severe second wave. The next slide, please. One of those countries is Malawi, where I am the coordinator for our UK government funded Team Girl Malawi project. The project itself focuses on supporting marginalised girls aged 10 to 19 who have never been to school or who have dropped out of school without gaining functional literacy and numeracy. These young people face multiple barriers to learning, including disability, extreme poverty, high household chore burden, work, marriage, pregnancy, childcare and breastfeeding. The project aims to significantly impact the girls' learning outcomes and allow them to transition to education, training or employment for improved learning and life chances. 
Uh, the next slide, please. Our first cohort of 2000 girls and 400 boys completed their first of the two year program in December, and we have just enrolled our second cohort to begin their first year this month. The project tries to take a really multifaceted approach to girls education, which begins with the provision of uh, local community based education classes using an adapted curriculum and delivery model developed and implemented alongside the Malawian Ministry of Education. So we're not operating outside of government systems, but really working with them to support the most marginalised. Weekly girls clubs provide a space for girls and boys to learn about sexual reproductive health and rights with a well-being and resilience focus. To ensure that marginalised girls are protected and supported, um, team specifically works alongside the wider community using a number of participatory approaches, including interactive radio drama and theatre, um, safeguarding workshops, partnerships with government child protection structures to really reinforce those processes and psychosocial counselling as well, recognising the multiple challenges that some of these learners face. Additionally, we work with local primary schools to strengthen their capacity for planning and the provision of inclusive education so that any learners that graduate from our programme are properly supported to go into primary school um, if that is their wish. We also provide vocational training opportunities for parents and guardians to try and combat that poverty barrier so they can better support their learners financially. And then we'll also be offering vocational training opportunities to the, to the learners themselves once they graduate as a different pathway to primary school or further education. As well as um, we also undertake food distributions to combat hunger, uh, which is a major barrier to learning. And the next slide, please. But in response to the global COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the Malawian government closed schools on the 23rd of March last year. As at one point in April, I think 91% of learners were out of school in, throughout the world. Um, and obviously with, in line with this instruction, the project's learning centres were also closed. There were real concerns that learners were likely to drop out and in some instances get married due to the long time spent at home and the pressures on family income created by the pandemic. There was also a chance that some of the learners would fall pregnant, which would impact their learning once the centres reopened, although it was absolutely not a barrier to them returning for, from our point of view, but would obviously make it considerably more challenging from for their point of view. In addition, a missed time in class led to fears that learners would not manage to complete the curriculum and there were increased child protection concerns due to the stress of the pandemic and the lack of contact with protection systems. There was therefore a need to, to really maintain contact with learners during this time and explore the possibility of distance learning to address the challenges above and something that you'll all be familiar with. Um, while modified safeguarding activities were able to continue through the school closures, it became clear following an assessment of our learners circumstances and their own preferences that a lack of access to mobile phones, to radio, to internet technology would really make it impossible to facilitate distance learning for the majority of them. So we concluded that some form of face to face teaching should continue even while schools were closed. In-person teaching was achieved as safely as possible by teaching in small groups, local to learners' homes, to allow for accessibility as well as social distancing. And we provided masks, additional hand washing facilities and extra staff training in line with government guidelines. We started doing very small, so one teacher to four students once a week, and then managed to scale that up to one teacher per 15 students four times a week. Um, Working um, with the Malawian government, we also decided to reduce the numbers of subjects that we covered in the curriculum from seven to four and provide learners with guided take home work. This was in recognition of the need to really reinforce core subjects such as literacy and numeracy following the lost time and potential loss of learning due to the long school closure. And it's something that the Malawian government themselves have decided to take up with their own community based education programs. 
Once mainstream schools partially reopened, um, weekly girls clubs were restarted alongside learning activities focused initially on well-being and safety, as those were really identified as the key priorities. Food distributions continued while adhering to COVID prevention measures and community engagement activities were carried out via a mobile van with a loudspeaker driving through communities. So it worked, we didn't encourage groups to uh, gather together. Using these methods, uh, cohort one managed to complete their first year of learning, which we're really pleased about, and we were enabled to enroll a second cohort to begin this month. Sadly, following a spike in infections, Malawi's schools had to close once again last week, but our learning from the first wave has allowed us to quickly pivot to new ways of supporting and engaging with them so we can still improve uh, the life chances for some of the most marginalised young people in Malawi. And the final slide, please. And yeah, this is uh, just the uh, kind of just to say thank you very much. And this is my email address and our new uh, website address and the social media if you wanted to engage any further. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Lucy. So I would encourage you to, to write down the social media contacts. If you've got questions for Lucy and some of the interesting work that she's doing, especially in Malawi, but like doing more generally as well, I encourage you to write those down. You can add them to the chat box as well. Um, and we will get to our question and answer session um, after our third presenter uh, this morning. So for Scott Deck, I would like to invite up uh, Charlotte Dwyer, the director of Scott Deck. Thank you, Charlotte, for joining us this morning. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to you for your presentation of a slightly different organization. It's great to see these three different uh, organizations all kind of pushing towards a common goal. Thank you very much, Will, and, and good morning, everyone. It's, it's um, great to be here. And I've, I've really enjoyed listening to the first two um, presentations, actually. And it's uh, interesting to hear such kind of diverse work that's going on, but it all seems to connect around the sustainable development goals and the certainly um, overlaps across across all the work that's going on. So Scott Deck is a, is a very small organisation. We're based in um, in Edinburgh and we are a education centre and work primarily with um, schools and um, youth workers within Scotland. We belong to a, a network of five centres called Development Education Centres. So we're in Edinburgh. There's one in Glasgow, there's one in Inverness, there's one in Dundee. Um, and this one in Aberdeen. And while we're all a bit separate, we do work very closely together. So if, you, if you're interested in the work that I'm talking about here in Edinburgh and you live in and you end up moving to some of the other areas of Scotland, there's opportunities to engage in similar organisations. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, please, Will. So this is a, just the, the our kind of mission statement about what, what we do. We are through education. We aim to um, fight global inequalities. It's really about that understanding and awareness of, of social justice and developing those those values in young people in order to um, foster change. And I suppose listening to um, Lucy's presentation and thinking very much about the extreme poverty and inequality that exists in the world. I suppose we're challenging young people to ask the questions around why, what, why is this the case and what needs to change in order to address equality and, and poverty everywhere. And our the approach to the, the learning that we do is very much about um, being participata participatory and um, being responsive to, to learners' needs, and we very much um, advocate the approach where we start with where the learner is and listen to their voices and encourage them to lead the learning. So th that's kind of the, the vision of, of what we aspire to do. And I'm going to move on and tell you a little bit more about, more practically about what we actually do. So all our work is framed around global citizenship. And for us, global citizenship is very much about um, a series of relationships. So it's relationships we have with other people, and it's also about relationships that we have with um, our planet and our world. 
and we have various dimensions that impacts on these relationships. So on one level, we have local and global relationships. So it's very easy, I think, to see how our, our relationships are and with people in our local communities and our local environments. However, sometimes it's more challenging to see what our relationships are like on a global level with other people, communities and the planet. And to, to think about how our lifestyle choices and actions can actually impact on other people in countries far away that we might not be aware of, for example, through um, supply chains, through um, our lifestyle that uh, impacts on climate change. So what we what we encourage learners to do is to look at their own look locally, but start to build those links and think about the impacts of their, their lives and choices here might have further afield. We also have uh, the other kind of dimension that impacts on these relationships is a um, temporal one. So we would encourage people to look back to, um, to think about the past and historically um, the legacy of, of um, things like slavery, the legacy of colonialism and think about how that legacy has come to um, impact and create the conditions that we're currently living in in the, in the present. And if our aspirations for the future is a more equal and more just and more sustainable world for everybody, then we need to interrogate these things that have happened in the past and think about how we can move forward to um, build a better future. So that, that is the, um, our approach to education, which is framed through global citizenship. And if we can move on to the next slide, we feel, um, um, and if you can click again, please, Will, that all our work that we, sorry, if we can go back to the slide, that's this slide, um, around sustainable development goals, through our education programs, we, we um, touch on all the um, sustainable development goals. But for us, our work is particularly aligned with target 4.7 under the education goal. And it's around this promotion of, of global citizenship, of diversity, of sustainable development. Um, and in, in Scotland, we have quite a warm um, policy context for um, developing this. And we're well supported by the Scottish government, which is good. But we continue to to advocate for this here, but also in, in larger networks um, across Europe and, and further afield to ensure that the purpose of education is not just about exams and attainment, that it includes these other aspects that are enshrined and, and covered in target 4.7. OK, so moving on to the next slide, please. I'm just going to cover that the the day-to-day um, -day work that we actually do and how we try to um, deliver on target 4.7 and embed our global citizenship approach. So rather than working directly with young people, we feel that we will have bigger impact by working and building capacity and teachers and youth workers and other educators. So we have um, a lot of professional learning courses for um, teachers and youth workers. We have courses, we have short term courses that you can dip into, and we also have um, a longer blended online learning program for secondary teachers. And we have a year long course which you can gain um, professional recognition from the General Teaching Council of Scotland for at the end. So we have a diverse range of um, courses that teachers can get into. We also um, in partnership with the other development education centres across Scotland, we also um, have an input to um, newly qualified teachers. So we aim to reach out and engage with as many teachers as possible in Scotland. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please. A further strand to um, the work that we do is we develop quite a lot of classroom resources. Uh, again, for both classrooms and youth settings. We've developed a pack on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which initially started out as a project with the Scouts and Guides. And we've now developed a pack for primary schools and a pack for secondary schools. It's, a, it's, a, it's an introduction to each, each of the goals. It's a pack of 17 postcards. And on the back, it's got some introductory activities to get the young people um, interested 
in the goals and exploring in each individual one. And then the booklet itself um, is a kind of signposting to, to more ideas and places that you can um, find out about more. We've got a film resources on film using films. We produced a pack on Malawi and the tobacco in industry a couple of years ago, which is was quite an um, interesting um, topic to look at. And most recently, we've been working on um, a series of toolkits for secondary teachers, which kind of acknowledges the the difficulties of maybe embedding some of this work into different subjects. So we have looked at how you might embed some of this into maths and into science. Um, because obviously topics like subjects like maths and science have um, huge roles to play in, in um, meeting the targets of the um, sustainable development goals. So we've tried to support secondary teachers by developing subject specific um, materials. Um, if you could click on please. Um, as a small organisation, we need to work in partnership and through other networks in order to um, have an impact. So I've mentioned the four other development education centres in Scotland. Uh, within that, we're also part of the Ideas Network, which is the International Development Education Association of Scotland. And that includes other organisations like Oxfam, um, Christian Aid, and those organisations who have um, an interest in education and global citizenship education as well. For us in Scott Deck, we have um, worked in many um, European funded projects so and that has enabled us to do um, some quite in-depth work with teachers project focused work with teachers um, which has produced some of our um, resources um, and opportunities for for teachers to really um, think about their their practice in, in innovative and, and unusual ways um, okay if we can click on to the next slide just to highlight a couple of projects that we've been working on recently um, in school worked with I think five countries across Europe that looked at um, rights based learning approaches. Um, unfortunately, um, some of the work was was cut short be um, because of the cl school closures um, last year as we were supposed to be running some workshops in, in some of the schools there. But we've, we've worked around that and tried to come up with other ways to um, maintain and finish off the project. The other project which we are currently working on is, is one that looks has this focus particularly on the, the secondary curriculum and how taking a subject approach can support embedding global citizenship. And that has um, enabled us to develop these, these teacher toolkits, which we did collaboratively with teachers and they've tested them out in the classrooms and also to develop um, a, a, an, long, an online learning course for teachers, which has modules on um, migration, climate change and gender equality, but also always through this lens of if I'm a maths teacher, or if I'm a modern languages teacher, how can I embed this into um, my own subject and, and work with my own pupils on it? Um, next slide, please. I think that might be the next. Yeah, so there's there's opportunities um, to get involved with Scott Deck. As I said, we're a small organisation, so we're always um, happy to welcome volunteers um, or people who are interested in supporting our work. Um, so we do currently offer um, placement based dissertations through Edinburgh University. Um, I think we've I think they've just gone through um, a couple of placements that are alive at the moment if people are interested in that. If you were interested in a summer internship, um, we're not actually in an office at the moment, but there's, there's hopefully there might be possibilities further down the line, then just get in touch and tell us what you'd like to do. And I suppose for us, it's all about getting our um, training resources out to teachers. So if you have teacher and youth worker friends, then please let them know about our website so that they can um, find and share our resources and materials with each other. So on our last slide, you'll find our contact details. Um, yeah, our website's got all our materials, um, which are free to download, and you can follow us on um, Twitter uh, and Facebook. We post quite regularly about all the opportunities and um, events that we organise for teachers. So yeah, thank you very much. That, that's a brief overview of what Scott Deck and what we do. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Charlotte. So once again, if you've got questions for, for Charlotte and Scott Deck, please uh, write them down, hold on to them. Um, we're about to get to the question and answer time. 
it, it's it's so perfect the timing of you three coming here and really putting the sustainable development goals at the center of your work. Um, a lot of our, I think, our audience uh, are coming from our comparative education international development course, which this week just finished a global education agenda and a focus on the sustainable development goals. So perfect timing to, for them to see how these actually play out in institutions and how they're implemented. Uh, excellent, great. Um, OK, so the next thing we're going to move to our panel questions. Uh, we have two questions, <clears throat> so I'll be inviting um, one of our event planning team members to ask the question and then uh, inviting the three of you to respond for two or three minutes to the question. Some of you may have already addressed some of these, so feel free to extend it or perhaps take it in a slightly different direction. Um, all right, so I'm going to invite uh, Young Yao Li to Hi. go ahead and ask our first panel question. So Young Yao, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. OK, hi, can you hear me? Yes. OK, um, my question is that as uh, as all of you have mentioned, uh, SDG is a very important issue in your work. And I have read from the reports of uh, WTO and World Bank that uh, the, the current Corona-19 pandemic uh, crisis have uh, have had a negative impact on the achieving of uh, SDGs. So how has this uh, Corona-19 pandemic affected your uh, work and future plans on achieving SDGs? Sorry. Excellent. Um, anybody want to jump in and start with that? So I know, Lucy, you've already talked some about how that shaped what you're doing, but I don't know if this is shaping Link's approach to the future, and if you put some thought into that. Maybe. Um, it's a really interesting question. I think that COVID-19 has been such a new, different experience for everybody. My um, experience is humanitarian primarily, and you know, normally you are dealing with a crisis in a kind of separate part of the world that is being responded to um, by people that they themselves have not been impacted by the crisis. And with COVID-19, you know, uh, in Edinburgh, we've been impacted, our team, our teams in um, our four partner countries have been impacted, and then our learners have been impacted as well. So trying to, to kind of mediate that, taking into consideration everyone's personal circumstances and experiences is, uh, you know, it's been a real challenge. Um, I've you know, spoken a fair amount about what we have done to try and kind of mitigate, you know, to try and uh, really build on learning and support learners, which, uh, you know, during COVID-19, which all kind of builds towards um, the SDG4 as well. And I think all we can do is kind of continually try to, to support them in, in best as best we can as the context continually shifts, because you know we had a, a big planning meeting at the beginning of December, um, and then over Christmas everything changed again. So it's really just trying to think, um, think ahead and plan for for different eventualities. Um, as an organisation, we are quite lucky in that we have a fair amount of institutional funding, um, and so we're still able to very much implement the projects that we. That we have at the moment um, and but you know looking ahead to new opportunities and trying to kind of pivot and shift how we might deliver those activities um, is just something at the forefront of everybody's minds so you know looking at remote um, teaching and learning looking at remote monitoring um, and seeing really how we can how we can shift things um, to, to best support um, uh, learners is is basically what we certainly in Edinburgh are spending a huge amount of time doing and uh, to try and support the, the teams in, in our partner countries as well. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Um, Charlotte, you also, Scott Deck does a lot of work in schools, and so I'm sure that there's been a, a very interesting impact of this pandemic on Scott Deck and its activities, but can you talk some more about how it's affecting your work and future plans? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, for, for us, we had to, we normally, all our training would have been face to face and it's suddenly become online like lots of other people. Um, so we've 
I mean, we've, we've managed to adapt quite well to deliver everything through webinars. Um, obviously, our um, because we're quite committed to delivering things in a very participative way, it's been quite a challenge to have participation um, embedded in, a, in an online webinar when it, with um, sometimes some platforms don't have the, as good a functionality as others, but I think we've adapted quite well to it. And the flip side is what we weren't expecting was um, when the school shut that more teachers actually have engaged with us on online things than face to face. So our actual numbers of engagements with teachers has not really um, shifted. We spent some time adapting some of our materials, which are classroom based so that they could be um, sent directly to learners for home learning. Um, so we have felt, yeah, we, we've felt that we've been able to mitigate quite a lot on how we can actually keep delivering and supporting the teachers. And I suppose it has encouraged us to engage more with technology. And we're certainly, in terms of the future, we're looking at um, keeping, trying to build communities of practice for groups of teachers and, and keep those online. Um, and it's, it's encouraged us to think more about um, teachers working in more remote areas where they couldn't travel to face to face. Um, um, training. So, for example, I'm working with our sister organisation up in Inverness on how we can develop um, a whole project that's, that's all online for teachers and will support those in, you know, on the highlands and islands and, and other more rural parts of Scotland so they can keep connected. And I guess our focus has also shifted on the health and wellbeing a little bit more. Um, of the teachers themselves, which is partly connected to this um, communities of practice group, so teachers don't feel isolated when they're working in small rural communities, and also um, thinking about the health and well-being of um, young people and some of the kinds of um, reflective activities that we have. Uh, I've got lots of um, practical application for that as well. So it's been a, a slight um, shift. And after the initial initial challenge, we've actually managed to embrace some of the, it's encouraged us to think differently about how we use technology. So that's been quite positive. Um, I would say for us, just to drop it in, I think the biggest impact, the bigger impact for us has actually been Brexit rather than COVID, because so much of our work, um, particularly in Scott Deck over the last 10 or 15 years has been funded through Europe and has been connected to working with European partners. And for me, I'm more worried about the impact that's going to have on our work going forward than the than COVID. OK, excellent. Thanks, Charlotte, for sharing. Uh, Gary, how about you and House? Well, I think um, because all our activities tend to be focused um, in on partnerships in Scotland and the implementation of the SDGs through that collaboration in Scotland, we've been less um, impacted by the pandemic. Um, obviously, we don't meet in person. We have an office which we don't use um, collectively, but in, an individual might be able to go in and work in the office. And I was going to say answer the phone, but nobody ever phones a a landline anymore anyway do they so um we we're not incredibly impacted because as i say um our activities aren't unlike my fellow um the the other two speaking about this we don't have that um international uh connection back to malawi or other countries in europe so our impact has been that we instead of having in life meetings and seminars and activities based in the office we actually do everything like everyone else nowadays online and we're learning how to do that some as somebody said was it charlotte we platforms may be good we're learning which ones are better than others so it's a learning exercise and i think we've all adapted quite well really to doing this that we're doing today much as i love coming to the university and speaking to people in person you can cope can't you by doing this so it's it's been a a radical change in some ways but I think most people have got quite used to it thank you yeah. Th thanks Gary yeah it's interesting to see how we've all adapted and some of the benefits I mean so here we're holding this online and there's obviously 
um, benefits to being able to pull from a lot more people that aren't just at the University of Edinburgh to join us today that we typically wouldn't be able to do if we were just in person. So some interesting benefits to it. Um, all right. So yeah, as I I'm seeing some questions come into the chat box, I'd encourage you to continue to add questions to the chat box and we'll start addressing those as soon as we're done with the next panel question. Um, so we have one more question to go. And one of the aims of this panel and event is really to expose some students that are really excited about working this field, but not sure how to get into it or what to do um, if they want to pursue something working in civil society or an NGO. So I think the second question will will address some of that. And I want to invite Vivi Yang uh, open to ask the second question. So Vivi. Hi, everyone. Um, my question is, can you please share um, your professional journey and how do you get to your current uh, position with us? Excellent. Thanks, Vivi. So once again, two to three minutes doesn't need to be the whole life story, but uh, anything about professional journey or tips that you can share would be great. So, um, Gary, let's go the opposite direction this time. So, is that me Gary? first? Yeah, Gary, can you get us started? Okay. Um, well, it's quite interesting um, thinking about the professional journey because I started um, um, so many years ago, I'm not going to say how many, um, as a lecturer um, and moved into uh, college lecturing and then into university lecturing and research in um, international education um, and it was quite interesting to then have a secondment to the Commonwealth Secretariat so the Commonwealth as you probably know is an organization of depending on who's in and who's out 52 53 sometimes 54 member states and it drew my attention to the importance of the international um, organizations through which decision making is made. I was um, in charge of the higher education desk at the Commonwealth Secretariat. So I had quite a lot of contact with ministers of education. Um, and I saw how important it was for those ministers to know what was happening in other countries. So when I did um, come back to lecturing at the University of Edinburgh, I had that background. And it was quite soon after that that um, the opportunity arose to move into um, more full-time um, volunteering position um, at UN House Scotland, uh, where I saw again the importance of the international um, in not just ministerial and head of government level, but also most importantly, as I said at the beginning, people-to-people uh, -people contact. And I was incredibly um, interested in the work of the UN. Having been at ComSec, I thought the UN, well, there's another area. And I've been um, delighted to have attended, to have attended many um, international meetings at the UN. And again, I see the importance of civil society in that. So that's a very potted history of how I come to be talking to you today. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Gary. I think one of the benefits to a question like this is we really see the variety of different career paths and journeys that are about. Uh, so, Charlotte, can you share? Yeah, um, so I, I started my professional career as a, as a teacher. Um, I was actually a teacher of English. I did a degree in English literature. Um, so I, I taught for a few years and I suppose this, the thing that kind of shifted in my career was that I decided to um, volunteer overseas. I went with an organisation called VSO, Voluntary Service Overseas, which um, I recommend as a volunteering organisation because they, they take professionals and you are placed in a placement where you're doing your professional job. Um, so I went to Eritrea and I was placed in the um, education ministry in Eritrea. And I did some teaching, but I also did some in-service um, teacher training for um, English teachers because, because of, uh, I don't really know why, but because of Eritrea's historic past, a lot of the English, or a lot of the medium for teaching in secondary schools was English 
but the teachers didn't have particularly good English skills, nor did the pupils. So I actually did some support in um, English teaching and I did a lot of methodology training as well for, for teachers over there. So that I spent two years um, in rural Eritrea doing that. And then um, when I came back, I got a job in Scott Deck. Um, it, it kind of married the education with the um, the teacher training that I had kind of developed as I, as I, as I had worked for the um, Ministry of Education in Eritrea. But I think that the more fundamental thing for me was the, the living and working. Um, when you go with BSO, you don't hang out with the expat community. You're embedded in small local communities overseas. And in two years um, working and living in rural Eritrea really brought home to me the, the massive poverty and inequality that exists in the world. And when I came back, um, obviously there's the international development route, but for me, um, obviously as an educator, I felt that getting involved in global citizenship education was one way of um, support and um, getting other people and young people in particular to be more aware of some of these issues and what needs, what structural changes need to happen in order to address some of those. Um, and then within, so I've been working in Scott Deck for 15 years now, and I suppose my experience of working in a small NGO is that you just learn an awful lot on the job. So I've learned how to do fundraising, I've learned how to manage a small organisation, I've learned about governance, I've learned about charity law. So over the last 15 years, I've just, I've just learned an awful lot just through doing the job. I don't think there's any kind of other professional qualifications you can take that would be the same as just learning what it's like being in a little organization. There's, there's such variety um, of different things and different jobs that I've done within it. Um, so I think that's one of the um, things I think about working as a little NGO that you have to become a, a master. You have to master many skills because there's many jobs that you have to do. So that that's kind of, yeah, that's my brief career journey. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Charlotte. I know we've got some people that here, uh, I think, on the call today that are teachers and are trying to figure out how do they take some of their teaching and do something uh, in the international world around it. So whether it's doing global citizenship education locally or working and volunteering uh, overseas. So I think that probably resonates with quite a few of our audience members today. Uh, Lucy, can you share some on your career journey? Yeah, sure. I um, I graduated from university back in 2008. I did a degree in politics and business. Um, it was my dream to go into TV at that time. Um, so I spent about six weeks, six years, sorry, working in documentary films um, as a researcher. Um, it just I partly just very interested in, in untold stories and uh, you know visiting interesting places, um, and then had the standard late twenties career crisis and uh, kind of challenges with freelancing, um, and wanted to just do something yeah have do something a bit different but that kept my interest in in the kind of un untold stories um, aspect uh, really, um, but I didn't want to kind of completely lose all of the skills that I had learned from working in TV. So I got a job for BBC Media Action, who are the BBC's international development charity, uh, as an assistant to three directors there, um, which is you know, kind of starting at the bottom. But actually, I mean, all of the assistants that worked at um, BBC were all kind of in their mid late 20s. So kind of it wasn't really um it kind of wasn't really starting at the at the bottom if you know what i mean um uh, and then through after the earthquake in nepal i kind of realized that the humanitarian side was really where my my interest lay um so i got a, a job at CAFOD, the catholic agency for overseas development as their emergency response group coordinator um, which was still again quite admin focused but did allow me to get a real insight into Kind of humanitarian side of things and, and a partnership approach as well. Um, it was at that time that I started a, a master's in international development at Birkbeck, which took me three years to complete, um, but I've done that now. Um, and during that time, I got a, an internal promotion to be their global emergency support officer. Um, so then I was kind of traveling to um, some, some contexts that they worked in um, about 30% of the time. 
um, did that for a couple of years and then kind of decided again, uh, I move away from London, but also to want to do something that was more focused on one project, because if you work in a, a kind of global response team, you're only dipping in and out of of different things and you don't really get to have any kind of in-depth understanding um, of, of one of one thing. So um, I applied to join Link about a year ago um, to to work on the Team Gar Malawi project. Um, I don't have an, uh, an education background, but it was more around kind of project management and coordination. Um, so kind of using a lot of those transferable skills um, and then some experience I had in, in safeguarding training that I think probably got me uh, got me the job. And yes, yeah, so I've been here for about a year. Excellent. Well, thanks, Lucy. Um, it's interesting to focus on some of those transferable skills and not having necessarily an education background, but still being able to work in an education project by having some of these really important skills. Um, all right, I want to open it up to questions from everybody. I know we've got a couple in the chat box, um, so I'd like to ask Chun, who's monitoring our chat box, um, to maybe share out. I think I've seen one from uh, Ali. So, Chun, can you read out Ali's question for us? Um, sure. So, um, she said that given that the work of your organization's response or reacts to the SDGs, can you please tell us a bit more about your relationship with the UN um, House Scotland? Okay. So, I think that's probably for our other panelists. So, uh, Lucy and Charlotte, can you talk about the relationship kind of you have, how much do you three know each other and engage with each other? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't mind starting. Um, we have, Scott Deck has worked with UN House, um, not, um, not in the last year or so, but we, part of the um, training that we offered for um, teachers is we did a um, seminar series on the sustainable development goals and we would try to in, engage with a someone who was a bit of an expert in, in, in the particular field of one of the goals. Um, and we worked with UN House, and some of their interns helped us to um, plan the events and to source some of the speakers. So that was a seat that was over, over, I think it was a couple of years ago now that we, we did that, but it's certainly um, something we, sh we would be happy to reconnect and, and think a bit more about in the future. Okay. Thanks. Um, Lucy? From my point of view, to be honest, I'm relatively new to the organisation and have spent most of my time here working from home in, in, in my own little bubble. Um, so I'm really interested to learn about um, UN House Scotland and I'm not aware of um, any relationship that Link has with them, but that doesn't mean that they don't. Um, but I'm certainly really interested in, in explore, exploring what um, what could be possible. So it's a yeah, really, really good introduction for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe I could just come in there. Would that be all right, Will? Of yeah, go uh, for it, Gary. Um, it's lovely to, to meet you um, online, Lucy. Um, for the last 10 years, um, you, UN House Scotland and Link had been in the same office area in Hunter Square. And so Link was one of um, UN House's very close uh, organizational contacts. Um, I personally had been on the board of Link for the last eight years, so I was moving off just as you arrived, Lucy. So I have a, a great um, understanding of uh, Link. There are many of our interns who have worked on various projects with Link in Edinburgh, and I'm absolutely amazed and delighted at the the quality of the work that is expected of the interns when they work with Link and also their enthusiasm for the various projects that are going on in the countries that you've um, mentioned, especially, as you know, in Malawi. So our backgrounds are very, very close and um, I, I'm delighted, absolutely delighted that um, both Scott Deck and um, Link seem to be going from strength to strength, even during this very difficult time. So, excellent. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, I know we've got a couple of questions in the chat box that are focused on kind of career 
possibilities and so forth. Um, I want to uh, jump in with with one question that I think we can all address more on the kind of content and vision um, of the three of your organizations, and then we'll we'll get to some of the kind of how do we get involved and how do we learn how to become you in the future. Uh, so all of you, and we've talked about this before, have focused on SDGs, but uh, and so as having worked previously at UNESCO, I'm a believer in the SDGs, but there are critics out there that say, well, the SDGs are either too top down or they aren't likely to be successful anyway. And so wondering if you can speak back to some of the critics and talk about why do you think the SDGs are important or why is your organization kind of taking those as part of your mantra or, or vision um, to engage? So, um, yeah, so let's see. Lucy, I don't think we've started with you lately, so. Uh, especially thinking about maybe the, the top down, given you work so much with local communities. Yeah, I mean, I think the SDGs are really important because um, the MDGs were incredibly top down. Um, and that was exactly what the SDGs were trying to not be. Um, and just the process of getting there, as you all know, was a very collaborative one. Um, and it's not just about, oh, you know, developing countries, you need to do this, but actually looking as a whole at the world and how we all need to build towards these goals. Um, so I think the, the whole ethos of it is incredibly important. Um, and like you say, we we work with um, local um, you know partners in in the countries that we work in, which again is incredibly important. Kind of the, not even building local capacity because they're building my capacity. They're, everyone in in Malawi is is uh, they're all amazing and teaching me a huge amount. Um, so I think it's really just focusing on on the kind of uh, learning between organisations and capacity sharing, and not about being top down. And I think that the SDGs echo um, all of that. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, any other responses from to the critics on that it's too top down or that it's um, not likely to happen anyway, so why are we pushing towards maybe an unattainable goal? Maybe I could just come in, uh, Will, just to say that um, we, as an international organisation, it is political and diplomatic, of course, and heads of state and ministers meet in the various fora at the UN, whether it's in New York or in Geneva or Nairobi or wherever, Vienna, depending on the substantive concerns of the particular meeting. Um, but as I mentioned, I think in, in the presentation, it's incredibly important to recognise that alongside that political and diplomatic set of meetings and persons, there are always civil society events parallel sessions and it is a real opportunity for civil society to engage with um, politicians and other civil society persons and to pressure governments from within the confines of these arena. Um, it's quite difficult sometimes in some countries to have access to those persons who are political or diplomatic, who have political or diplomatic posts. But, do you know, if you are in the same building and having a cup of tea with, it's easier to get your sense of who these persons are and develop a, an empathy with them, an understanding, a common understanding and empathy. Um, and I've just given an example. Uh, it's not in education, but it could be. Um, quite recently, the SDG 16, Peace, Security and Strong Institutions, um, within the last 10 years at the UN, civil society has been pressurising governments to um, put forward a treaty on the abolition of nuclear weapons. If it was down to governments, they would not do it. If it was down to head of state, they wouldn't do it. If it was down to diplomats, they can't do it. But civil society pressured at every single opportunity at the UN to get those political diplomatic uh, leaders to get their states' parties to agree to a treaty that if it had been left to them, they would not have agreed to. It came into force last Friday. 
And it's just incredibly important that the humanitarian concerns that those people had been speaking about at the UN were the ones that were heard by the political and diplomatic leaders. Uh, and so I do feel that the UN has many problems and those problems may well be diplomatic and political, but in terms of person to person, it's a great opportunity for people on the ground here in Scotland and elsewhere to get their collective voices heard through a whole variety of channels that if we didn't have them, we would be breathed of those opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gary. I think that's an interesting example of, of how we can nudge and push uh, policy and leaders from civil society. Um, Charlotte? Yeah, absolutely. And just to pick up on that, and I think um, to pick up on what, what, what um, Gary's saying is that that's exactly the type of educational approach that we're trying to, we're trying to empower and give agency to young people so that they can have these critical conversations that they do feel that they can um, participate in civil society movements and, and ask those difficult questions. And certainly it's very much about um, developing those critical literacy skills so that you never accept anything on face value, that you always interrogate it and look at the assumptions behind it. Because um, obviously, I mean, for us, there are definite tensions between sustainable development and economic development within the SDGs. There's a, a lack of mention of, um, of rights. Um, but but I think the point is it's a, it's a good framework. It's a good thing to embrace, but it doesn't mean that you can't interrogate it um, critically and develop those. And as, and as Gary says, that you should have create these strong civil society organisations that then have something to, to um, coalesce around. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, all right, I want to open this up more broadly. I know we've got a couple more questions in the chat box. Um, Chun, can you uh, share the question from Lily for us? Um, sure. So um, what kind of skill do you value the most um, in working in um, the NGOs? So. And uh, Lucy, you started talking about transferable skills. Maybe we can start with with you on this question. So giving advice to people potentially looking to uh, join an organization, a civil society or non-governmental organization, what skills would you encourage them to? I, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I think it's, you know, it, it's a two way street. It's about, you know, what what do you have to offer and what are organizations looking for um, so you know partly it's about kind of what are you passionate about so not necessarily just trying to to kind of push yourself into a job advert but also looking more broadly about you know what what you have to offer and your interests i mean i transitioned from um tv to to uh, an ngo and so media was one of my uh, my skill sets and so I, I deliberately looked for um, a, a job that kind of didn't waste that you know didn't waste that interest didn't waste that um, the, the skill set that I had um, but equally you know if you have uh, an engineering or an education or a medical background there are a whole host of NGOs that that really specialize in in those particular areas as well so um, to you know really maybe look out look out particular organizations that specialize in the things that you're interested in um, and then also you know potentially not all work is project work or it certainly doesn't need to be at the beginning of your career i, I went through the admin route you know um, and so in in that case really demonstrating that you've got good um, coordination skills that you've got some admin experience that you're kind of good at speaking to people and you know you can demonstrate bringing people together and having good communication skills, you know, all those really kind of basic transferable skills that are good for, for any job, I think really play a role here. And to not um, to not necessarily think to, you know, limit yourself to necessarily going straight into something that is, that is project related. Um, and, you know, to think about also that NGOs have a multitude of functions. Um, I think it was uh, Charlotte that was saying, you know, you work for a small NGO and you become a, a master of all trades. Um, but equally, the the larger NGOs have different um, you know, different departments that look at finance, HR, communications, IT, um, and they also have really interesting opportunities 
um, in their own right, um, but also to potentially move across into programmatic work if, if that was what you uh, are ever interested in doing. Um, I'd also say don't overlook faith-based organisations. Um, so I um, used to work for, for CAFOD, who are a Catholic agency, and I, I think that some people were put off by that. Um, but actually, it's a you know it's a very um, diverse organisation in its own right, and and um, have a lot of opportunities um, for different specialties. Um, I think I do think one one kind of basic fact is that a second language can be very useful. I don't have one, so <laughs> it's not a prerequisite. But I, I think that probably would have helped um, if I'd known French or Spanish, certainly. Um, and uh, I, I found doing a master's useful. Um, uh, I, I think that it's not, again, not always a prerequisite, but I certainly found it helpful to kind of look at my industry critically um, and to kind of get some of those um, skills. And I had a, an opportunity to go um, to India as well, which then kind of helps build um, that kind of critical thinking and, and, and field experience. I hope that don't limit your options is my main my main <laughs> message so uh, lucy i want to come back because you mentioned something in your first talk on you when you're talking about your career path you had done something with kind of the humanitarian piece of bbc and you made a comment on how that seemed like a very entry level and come you know uh then can you talk about the maybe importance of getting your foot in the door uh, and thinking about you know being open to more entry level things as well. Yeah, I, I, I really I'm a big believer in um, not necessarily, you know, realizing that not all routes are direct. Um, so while I had, you know, six years experience in TV, I'd not worked for an NGO. So I wouldn't have been able to expect to walk in at a, you know, a technical advisor or a project officer because I don't have that experience and there are plenty of other people that do. Um, but what I did have was, you know, TV experience. I had worked at the BBC before um, and I was incredibly well organised because I'd spent six years organising film shoots. Um, so when this assistant role came up, I thought, OK, it's not where I want to be for the rest of my life, sure, but it's it's a really good transitional pathway into um, yeah, getting my, my foot in that door, so to speak. And, um, you know, I think that there is often a reluctance to people to not want to go through the admin route, but actually it does give you <clears throat> a lot of skills and you, particularly if you're an assistant to a senior level person, um, in both instances for me, um, having access to directors who then think that you're good at what you do and want to support you forward was uh, a huge reason why I then managed to move in the direction that I wanted to. Um, and you know, equally, you know, a lot of the people that worked in those roles were, you know, came with their own backgrounds, with their own experiences. So it wasn't seen as, you know, you are entry level. It was actually that you were kind of coordinating departments, um, but you know, just using a different skill set. So I would really um, encourage encourage that as a as an entry route in. Excellent. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, Charlotte, I'm going to come to you. So Lucy mentioned that in a small NGO, and you've talked about it before, there's these multiple hats you play. Um, are there specific skills getting into a space like Scott Deck or a small NGO or CSO that you would encourage individuals to work on or attain for? Um. I suppose there's two kind of routes. I mean, me and my colleagues all have an education background. We're either teachers or youth workers originally, and we all do have um, experience of working overseas. Um, one of my colleagues worked in international schools, which I did for a bit as well in various parts of the world. Um, and my colleague Kate also um, did VSO on a different program. She, she managed a different program. So we do have that kind of collective background. But I would also say that um, the other people in our office are someone who's done communications for us and the admin person who unfortunately we lost due to the pandemic. Um, but we used an organization called Adopt an Intern and I really recommend them. So we um, we found Katie, who's now our communications officer through and we interviewed quite a few people and um, 
after she did the internship with us, she now works with us doing our communications. Um, so she didn't have a, she had she had some previous work experience in education, but not not, not any of that, nothing specific to what, what Scott Deck does. So she came through that route. And we also, we had just um, recruited an, another amazing intern through the organization, but it was right at the beginning of the pandemic and we weren't in a position to, we couldn't quite figure out how we could work, introduce her, uh, remotely, because given it was it was back in in April when she was due to start, but I would I would recommend looking at looking at that. So there's as as Lucy said, there's different routes in, but I'd recommend adopt an intern. Um, and I think just in terms of of core skills, I think it's that flexibility and adaptability are really core. Cool, so that we so that you come in and you don't think, well, this is what I do in my position, and I can't do other things. You can't have that silo mentality. You have to basically think, well, actually, yes. I can learn that or I can I can do this or I can find someone who can help me with that. Um, and it's very and I suppose the other core skill when you're working in a little NGO like ours is, is um, being able to, to network. I would say that I spend as much time talking with um, colleagues in other organisations across Scotland. Um, we work with local authorities and education people in order to do the work we do. So that ability to, to network and having really strong communication skills as well. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Gary, uh, for you, what skills do you think? Well, I think it, the others have really covered it. Um, I just take up the, the thought that um, networking is, as Charlotte said, incredibly important. And it's often the case that um, when somebody arrives, you don't quite know what they are capable of, and they don't know what they're capable of. Um, it's giving people an opportunity to spread their wings and for some people that's a bit scary and they don't particularly like spreading wings whereas others really thrive on it and it's I suppose it's having a, a view of the horizon and if if you can when you speak to somebody on arrival and you can see that they are looking at the horizon rather than down at their feet I think that's quite important and the other thing that Lucy drew attention to is um, having a, a second language. I would go with second, third, fourth language. And most of the people on this call, I think, are probably linguists in one way or another. And that is such an important attribute. It's not to be um, put into a category. I think it's a key concern, a key skill. So networking, having a view of the uh, horizon, having languages, and just an ability to be flexible, which my colleagues have said, it's really important not to get into the silo mentality, but to be as flexible as possible. And I think for us at UN House Scotland, one of the key issues is having an intellectual curiosity. And nowadays, it's so important that the dumbing down, and I'm sure Charlotte would agree, the dumbing down of education is something we have to stop. We have to think high level skills in intellectual capacity are what we are trying to achieve in our education system in Scotland. And I think I take up the point that Charlotte was saying, it's really good to make contacts. I'm going to talk with you, Charlotte, after this, and we'll see how we can collaborate together on that particular issue in education. Thanks, Will. Excellent. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. I know we're just about out of time. Um, we have one fairly specific question uh, to Gary, but also to and this is kind of broadly to everyone else. So, Gary, you mentioned um, that you are open to placement based dissertations. If individuals are interested in in working with you or with any of the panelists there, um, what's the best way to engage? Is that something that I can I know we've talked about potentially sharing out information after this uh, with audience members. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, that's fine. I mean, if somebody has an idea for a dissertation that's um, perhaps inter international education is the theme of what we're talking about. Um, and as we at UN House Scotland have quite a number of persons who are very engaged in SDG 4 and the various targets. If somebody does have a, an idea for a dissertation, just um, perhaps, Will, if you could just send my email to that person, or if if anyone 
didn't want to come that route, just go to hello at UN House Scotland, which was the last slide, um, and, and we'll take it from there. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Gary. So I will be sharing out the slides with everybody who's registered for this. Um, we'll do that shortly after the presentation, so you'll have contact information. Um, but yeah, if so, Taya, you can uh, email me and I can share out Gary's information if you're interested as well. So we, we are at the end of our first panel. I want to really thank our panelists, so Charlotte, Lucy and Gary for joining us this morning. It's been great. Uh, hearing from the different organizations and your what you're doing, how you've adapted in the current pandemic, and a little bit of insight on how you've got to where you're at in your career. Uh, I also want to thank our event planning team, so which includes Lynchy and Chu Chu Yi for creating our event flyer, um, our panel questions asked by Yong Yao and Vivi, and our chat box moderator Chun. So really useful stuff. I appreciate everybody being here. If, uh, if you're going to hang around for the second panel, uh, please stay. This is the same link, so you don't need to leave, but we'll take a short couple minute break before our second panel gets started. So thanks so much, everybody. I hope you have a great day and uh, I'll be in contact with our panelists. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, and if you are interested in hanging around, we've got three different organizations that are going to be joining us, and we will get started in about two minutes. So it's a chance for you to grab a cup of tea if you're just with us. Uh, we'll get started in about two minutes. Yeah, Ty, definitely hang around for the second session. Even if you weren't registered, you're welcome to stay. Okay. Uh, hello, Will. Can you hear me? You hear me? Yes. So Thanks. welcome, uh, William, Shelia. William. Yeah, sorry, Bill. <laughs> Bill, Bill Thompson. Am I now linked up to you now? Yeah, yeah, feel free. Hi, William. Um, it's she I'm Sheila. I'm here as well. Excellent. Hi, Sheila. Hi. So, yeah, and then I think I saw uh, Philippa join us. Yeah. I was just going to say I'm here too. I feel as if I'm lurking somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I should note that we are still recording um, the session. Um, I mistakenly didn't start the recording until after Gary was done with her presentation. So, um, but we are recording because I know we've got a lot of interest and hearing about you and your organizations. And thank for that. Um, I've got all the PowerPoints together on this slide, so you just need to let me know when you want to move to the next slide and I'll move us along. Um, and yeah, so thanks everybody for joining. Um, I'm going to grab a sip of water and then I will be back in one minute to get us started. William, okay. can I just say something? It's Sheila. Yeah. I've, uh, my slides actually have got, uh, whenever you go on to a slide, can you click till you reach all all the pictures that are on it in one. I think I thought I was going to be doing it. Um, I'll, I'll say that at the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think um, I, I've done kind of a trial run, so I know some. Right, have okay, yes, that's fine. Thank so, you. Yep. No problem. All right, I'll be right back. Okay. See you in a minute.
All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to panel two of the Comparative Education and International Development Extended Community Panel. So the hope for this panel is to bring in local organizations to hear about how they're engaging in issues in education and international development and learn a little bit about their own career paths and trajectory. So my name is, is William Smith. I'm the coordinator for the CEID community at Moray House at the University of Edinburgh. I'm excited to have everybody here today. Um, this panel is being recorded so others can access it after we're done. As we're going through, please do tweet about this event or connect with the CEID community on Twitter um, by connecting with at Moray House CEID. So off we go. For the panel structure, we'll start with a about 10 minute presentation from each of our three panelists today, and then we'll open it up and have two questions uh, that we'll ask to all the panelists before we have questions from the general audience. As we're going along, please feel free to add any questions you have to the chat box. Uh, one of our event planning team members, Chun Deng, is monitoring the chat box for us, and we'll make sure that we get those questions asked at the end of our panel today. I'd like to welcome our panelists today. I'm really excited to have these three organizations and individuals joining us today. Uh, we'll start in a bit with Scotland's International Development Alliance, um, Philippa Ramston, who's the program manager in safeguarding and mentoring. Then we'll hear from Scottish Love and Action's trustee, uh, Sheila Cannell. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Dr. William W. Thompson, who's the founder and director for the Edinburgh Peace Institute. So welcome everybody. I really appreciate you spending your morning with us today. Uh, I think it's gonna be a great time. I know the first panel went really well, a lot of excitement in hearing about what everyone does. So, all right, so at this point, I wanna hand it over to Philippa to talk some and introduce us to Scotland's International Development Alliance. So Philippa, just let me know when you wanna move forward with the PowerPoint. Thank you very much for the welcome. I'm very, very pleased to be part of the um, the discussion this morning, being um, very much an advocate and someone who's passionate about education in development. So if we go into the first slide, um, I can start to introduce what the Alliance is. Um, oh, sorry, the very first one just gives you a description of the organisation that we are, um, and that is uh, we are a network, we are the membership body in Scotland for everyone who's committed to creating a fairer world, free from poverty, injustice and environmental threat, threats. Um, the Alliance itself is, a, is different to the other organisations perhaps that you've been hearing about this morning in that we do not directly implement um, programmes or projects, but rather we are a network, we are a, um, an alliance as, as we say we are. We have a diverse membership of over 200 organizations and individuals who are you know really um, believing in that same philosophy about Scotland for a fairer world. We have 169 organizational members that includes NGOs, businesses, academic institutions and public sector bodies as well. So I think almost all of the panel speakers across both panels are working with the Alliance or members of the Alliance in some way. So it's a really nice cohesive um, sector. Um, although we don't implement projects ourselves, our members work in over 100 countries in all of the 17 uh, European UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So we represent a huge um, interest in international development and we originally formed in 2000 at that time as the network of international development of organizations in scotland or nidos but evolved in 2015 to uh, the alliance really to better represent uh, the way the organization had evolved so i'll go into a little bit more detail on the next slide um, if we could move on so our, our values and mission, I think, really would guide, uh, would set out very clearly what we aim to do. Our vision is of a Scotland which is increasingly committed to a fairer world, <clears throat> a world that is free from poverty, 
injustice and environmental threats. And our hashtag, as well as our kind of our, our motto, if you like, is Scotland for a fairer world. And in order to achieve our vision and work towards it, our mission is to engage people and organisations in Scotland who, with international development um, and attract their informed support. Um, we, our mission is also to help people and organisations in Scotland working for effective international development, which really strengthens the, the support base and improves the impact of all of our work together. And our, the third aspect of our mission is to represent our members and the people and communities that they serve to local, national and international decision makers. So that sets out what we what we aspire to and what we want to do and how we aim to do it. Um, on the next slide, we go into a little bit more detail about what we actually do. Um, we have a number of services and areas of work. Now, I should stress we are a tiny team, we're a tiny organisation. There are seven of us in total um, and all of us own or manage one of these particular areas. But we, what we try to do is make our members more stronger, influential, powerful, have a greater voice by creating a space for dialogue and enabling members um, to network and learn and develop and access more funding and have more influence in the sector. <clears throat> Broadly, the activities and services that we provide include policy and advocacy, effectiveness and learning, fundraising support, networking opportunities and news and updates. And I'll go into those in a little more detail on the following slides. In the area of um, policy and advocacy, we are working quite extensively on COP26, which is the climate change um, uh, conference, if you like, which was meant to come together in November last year, but should be um, all being well. I think nothing is certain these days, uh, but it's as certain as it can be. Uh, but we'll be meeting in Scotland in uh, November of this year. That's a huge area of work. It's essential to many of the areas of um, international development and underpins, I think, all, all future dialogue. We've also been doing <clears throat> a lot of work around the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and bringing together a, a kind of picture of how um, our members uh, putting that, that work all together are contributing to the SDGs um, from Scotland-based international development interventions. We are the Secretariat and convene the International Development Cross-Party Group of the Scottish Parliament, which is a really important um, advocacy and policy uh, vehicle. We bring together roundtables with all of the parties. We are um, not party political, of course we are impartial, but it's important if we are advocating for um, improvement and sustained support for international development that we engage um with you know across all all um aspects of the uh political um sphere um we are also working particularly on um advocacy around covid19 the implications of that for example the cuts in funding because of the the needs to uh obviously respond to the pandemic so we we looking for a balanced um uh, advocacy around that and we also obviously respond to topical issues and discussions which come up. There's been a lot of discussion for example around the weighting of language and how it can be um, pejorative and a further um, power dynamics uh, and inequity about white gaze and Black Lives Matter campaign and similarly shifting the power and what is often termed the localization agenda. Um, we also have a role in organising conferences and events. Um, we are having a conference, it's not on 2nd of September, I apologise, it's the 22nd of September this year, um, and it will be focusing on climate and working very closely with um, the, the, uh, the COP26 movement. And the theme for this year's conference is the climate crisis from the front line. We also are organising a photo um, competition and exhibition 
a digital exhibition uh, and that will be launching in in June and will be along the uh, the, uh, the the same theme as the climate crisis. I can see a question in the chat box so I can either answer it now or um, come back to that later but it's questioning uh, what is white gaze really good question it's one of these expressions which um, has been adopted quite rapidly into into the language around questioning the way that we see things and asking us to question the way we see things and so often um, the way we perceive understand and interpret is through uh, often a white gaze which means um, the, a privileged position of for example me sitting here as a white woman and I have certain perceptions even although I may not realize them so it's that it's that lens that you see things through without even realizing um, I, if we could move on to the next slide I can go into the other areas of what the Alliance does so in member services <clears throat> We, um, we operate a funding database so that, uh, or we do operate it, we have access to a funding database so that organisations can um, look through this to see where they may be able to access funding. We have an online community where members can talk, interact, ask questions about certain things, we can share information. We have a monthly newsletter and a monthly bulletin, which the, the newsletter goes out to everyone. Anyone can sign up for that. The bulletin is only for members. And we also promote our activities and the activities of members on social media as well. Um, on the next slide, uh, I'd like to touch quickly on my own area of work, which is effectiveness and learning. And at last, I can hear you say a little bit about learning and education. Um, so the uh, Effectiveness and learning services include a really strong training portfolio and this is partly something which we uh, organise in relation to the things that our members are looking for, but is also responsive to changing needs. A lot of the examples of topics are project design, project management, fundri fundraising, MEL, which is monitoring, evaluation, learning, um, reporting, as in reporting on your activities and reporting to donors, and also digital and social media tools. Uh, so not a huge variety of different trainings that we offer. Um, we also convene working groups. Um, one is on MEL, the Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning, on Safeguarding and on um, Inclusion, uh, called the Leave No One Behind working group. And we also have a fundraising group. A significant part of our work at the moment is around safeguarding um, and that is uh, my current portfolio. I'm on a secondment doing a, a specific project around safeguarding mentoring um, and that has included uh, a training programme, developing tools and resources, um, developing specialists, a, a cadre of specialists on safeguarding for Scotland based organisations working in international development. We also have a mentoring program which provides support to organisations really on their organisational development and on specific areas which could be developing their strategies, theory of change, fundraising plans, their monitoring um, frameworks uh, and it's for the organisation rather than individuals so that it supports especially very small charities and organisations to, to strengthen the way that they work. And we hold a number of learning events, webinars, information seminar sessions. Um, I think there's one more slide, perhaps, or that might be all before I pause. Um, just to, to this is an overview of the alliance. What I haven't mentioned yet is the um, the role in education, and that is perhaps more of a personal one with my own um, professional background, but also. It's such an important role of the Alliance to support organisations as they learn and develop. And many of our members are working specifically in education because we know that education is the single most powerful tool uh, in order to tackle um, poverty, inequality, 
uh, and uh, the challenges in the world. So I'm going to pause there. Um, I think I may have taken a couple of minutes more than my 10 minutes, um, but I'll pause there now and hand back over to William um, and we'll cover the other questions, I think, later on in the discussion. Excellent. Yeah, Philippa, thank you so much. Um, I know you've got a couple of slides that will address the other panel questions, so we'll come back to those when we get to them. Uh, so if you've got a question for Philippa and the Scottish International Development Alliance, please do write it down. You can add it to the chat box. We'll have an open question and answer time at the end of our panel presentations and questions. So uh, don't forget it. Please write it down to make sure we've got a good discussion coming up later. OK. At this point, um, I'd like to add, invite uh, Sheila Canal joining us from Scottish Love and Action. Thank you, William. I think I'm hearing some other noise at the moment. Is that? No, uh, thank you very much. I'm speaking as a trustee of a small Edinburgh based charity. Scottish Love in Action, which supports marginalised and vulnerable children in India, uh, and we work in partnership with NGOs in India. Um, this year we're actually 21 years old, um, and I'm, uh, I've been pretty regularly for the last four or five years out to India every year to see our organisations. In fact, I was uh, I, today, a year ago, I was travelling back from India um, and not expecting uh, to find what was going on in the world uh, or what would be going on in the world after that. Everything has changed. And I think what I'm going to say is going to be permeated with a lot of talk about COVID. Um, the next slide, please. Um, I want to talk first of all about why we support India, why we support girls and why we support education. Uh, India, first of all, India is a middle income country which has markedly improved the position for the poorest in society, but there are still huge numbers of people left behind. Um, our NGO partners are based in Hyderabad, which is the fifth largest city in India with a population of 12 million. So twice the size of Scotland and, and a bit, um, and it's one of the world's fastest growing cities. Um, of great importance at the moment, it manufactures one third of the world's vaccines. Um, what this means in practical terms is that Hyderabad attracts a migrant population, particularly as agriculture is rapidly changing in Indi India. Um, the traditionally extended family structure in India is breaking down. So a Save the Children survey in 2015 showed that there were 27,000 children living on the street in Hyderabad. And one of our partners estimated last January that this had risen to 36,000. And who knows what it's like now um, post-COVID. Um, research um, by UNICEF, amongst others, is showing that many in South Asia, uh, India uh, being the main uh, country there, who have emerged from poverty um, are now dropping back below the poverty line again. And of course, education is so important to think about in relationship to this. I, I needn't barely say to this audience that education is the proven route out of poverty um, and the NGOs that we support in Hyderabad are all involved in education. At the moment, um, COVID has closed schools in India. They've been closed since March last year and are still not open, although there is uh, hope to bring back some of uh, the older kids doing exams shortly. Um, so what we are hearing from our NGO partners, we're hearing stories of girls getting married during this time, of being made to work, um, of suffering hunger, approaching famine, and in extreme cases of girls being sold to make money for their families. Um, so we know, we know we want to deal with girls' education. Um, uh, and I think I can talk this about this better by uh, talking about the projects we support. So could I have the next slide, please? Um, we support three grassroots India partners in Hyderabad. Rainbow Homes, first of all, is a strategic organisation which runs about 50 children's homes across India, setting strong standards for the care and education of the children. The homes are based in underused school buildings, which provides a low cost solution for homes for these children. When the children move into the home, they receive nutrition and medical care and bridge courses 
in education and social skills to bring them up to the, their age appropriate level. At the other end of the age range, Rainbow Homes also runs an extremely impressive program called UDAN, or Taking Flight. This is about the transition into adulthood for children in their homes. UDAN helps children to imagine and prepare for their future life, for it, to think about their further education, jobs, money, where they live, relationships. They start this at the age of 16. Uh, with a view that they will have to leave the home that they've been living in uh, at 18. Very impressively, the programme also includes a strong strand on getting the young people to think about how they can give back to society. And they often do this by helping out in the homes that they have grown up in. The, se uh, the second organisation we support is called Asrita, and this is one of the specific homes in Hyderabad that Rainbow Homes uh, sets the standards for. They cater for 100 girls who would otherwise be living on the streets using the, using the Rainbow Homes methodology. I often use the story of a girl called Prasanna to describe their work. Uh, I've met Prasanna several times. She lived on the streets of Hyderabad until she was 10, scavenging for waste and occasionally doing domestic work. Um, she moved into Asrita. They work with girls on the street through um, social, what they call social mobilizers, social workers. And it sometimes takes some time for girls to be persuaded to move into the home because it, the life they know is on the street. Um, Prasanna had had no education by the time she was 10. In the home, she received the bridge courses in education, in health and nutrition to bring her up to the age appropriate level. I happened to be in Hyderabad um, on the day uh, when she heard that she had been accepted to study nursing and midwifery on one of the, in one of the better Hyderabad universities, where she's now doing very, very well and is engaged on the Udan program um, and is what the sort of person who will, con who having had the experience in the home, will continue to give back uh, to society. Our third partner, Voice for Girls, uh, is is a is a very inspirational, very exciting um, NGO in, uh, run out of Hyderabad. What they do is they run residential camps for adolescent girls from impoverished backgrounds, teaching the girls about their bodies, their health and their human rights, covering reproductive health, sexual relations, domestic violence, conflict resolution, financial literacy, career options, future planning and leadership. Interestingly, with the name Voice for Girls, they are very aware that if they really want gender equality, uh, boys and men have to be involved too. So they also run Boys for Voice. I've met both girls and boys who have been on these camps and they are really empowered by the knowledge they have received. And this is the sort of knowledge they don't get in the normal school curriculum in Indian schools. Of course, all of this has been disrupted by COVID. Voice is now delivering its programs using WhatsApp and mobile homes, mobile phones directly to girls and boys at home. Um, although it's actually a limited number that actually have the facility of, of WhatsApp and, and mobile phones. But, it, but there's been an interesting ripple effect from the delivery of this program to children at home. They have, they have started to learn what, uh, to share what they've learned with their friends in their local village communities. Um, and even with their mothers, who, of course, in India, often the mothers may own, of a, the mother of a 12 year old girl may be less than 30. So they have been learning from this also. I, I, I want to read you something which we just received yesterday about a girl called Rashitha, who attended a Voice for Girls camp when she was about 12 or 13, a few years ago. She was extremely shy, but she says, attending the camp changed me a lot. I was able to develop my speaking skills during the camp and learnt about a lot of things, including inner and outer beauty. Even my teacher saw a difference in me. I was a confident girl after attending the voice camps. She went on to attend the third voice camp called the Saki camp. Saki is the word for Indian word meaning leadership. So she, this was the camp that teaches girls leadership skills. At the end of the camp, all the girls who had been trained were given handbooks to use with other people. Rashika shares, shared hers with, shared what she had learned with her school friends. 
But more important, importantly, she has also been doing this during the local, with her local village community, running village learning classes during the pandemic. A real ripple effect. She says, I was very sad to see the condition of child marriage in my community. I wanted to talk about it. Um, and my father let me go speak to the village elders. Um, I assured him that I will be respectable towards them and try to put forward the points which are important. My village elders heard me. I am glad that I was able to talk to them and make them realise the evils of child marriage and how it affects the lives of young girls. I want villages to be free from child marriage. I also want to conduct programmes for girls to make them aware about the importance of education and encourage them to negotiate for their higher studies. The ripple effect of a programme like Voice for Girls, it doesn't just affect the girl who attends the, the, the programme, but all the girls around her. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, I, I, what I want I want to talk in the final, my final slide is a little bit about what Scottish Love in Action actually does on the ground. In fact, we are primarily a fundraising organisation. Um, we, 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 um, we don't receive any public funding. Um, so here in Edinburgh, our work is actually dominated by fundraising um, to be able to fund this work in India. We raise funds in a variety of ways. And of course, COVID has intervened in this as well. Uh, regular giving is our most important source of funding. People who have heard about our projects and want to continue to support them. We run the events. These have been very disrupted this year and we hope to get back on track next year. We have corporate sponsors, sponsorships. So if you go to to Tuk, the Indian restaurant Tuk Tuk in Edinburgh or in Glasgow, uh, you, you have the option of uh, supporting our work. And we do specific appeals and applications to trusts uh, uh, and have got quite a lot of expertise in doing this. Most recently, we fundraised through the Big Give Christmas Challenge and would be very happy to share information about that with anybody who, who would like it. We can't do this without our volunteers. We were started by volunteers and we literally couldn't do without them. And I suppose if anybody listening in this audience would be interested, we'd be delighted to um, uh, to have you as volunteers, um, perhaps even as trustees. We are always looking for uh, younger people to be involved. And we've recently had several people from the University uh, of Edinburgh who have been helping us doing doing some some research, which has been very useful indeed. Thank you very much. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, Shelia, for sharing for Scottish Love in Action. So again, if you've got questions for Shelia and Scottish Love in Action, please do write them down. Don't forget them. Um, and we will make sure we have a chance to talk about those, including uh, potentially Shelia sharing some more on what is a trustee and what does that mean to be engaged as a trustee. So, uh, all right. Now I'd like to invite <coughs> Uh, Dr. William W. Thompson up. He's the founder and director of the Edinburgh Peace Institute to share a little bit about uh, the EPI. Thank you. Uh, I'll turn the camera off because we have buffeting at the moment. Yeah. Sounds good. I think we're all ready. OK, thank you, Will. Right. Uh, so the Edinburgh Peace Institute is a brand new organization we are launching this year. Uh, we've been working on it over the past year, but it's been uh, it's kind of the development of a couple of other uh, NGOs that we've worked in and kind of developed over the, the last few years. So uh, and it's also bringing together my academic background to develop this this work to be more of a kind of practitioner based organization. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so the questions that we want to uh, address today are what are the goals and aims and functions of EPI, the Edinburgh Peace Institute? Why is uh, peace education a focal point for our work? And what peace education projects are we working on? OK, so next slide. We have three main functions or uh, th there are three points to the, the structure of the organization that we're trying to build at the moment. And the first one is that we're going to deliver training. Uh, we, we already have done over the past few years. Uh, we're going to deliver research 
and we're also going to consult also. Uh, so the training is developed for its practitioner training for humanitarians and governments, but we also collaborate with uh, academic institutions and we offer uh, practitioner based MSC MA collaboration and fieldwork opportunities for students also. The research, uh, we have our own original research uh, projects uh, and the team. Uh, we, we engage in policy focused research and again we will also engage in collaboration with academics who want to work in the peace and conflict field. And then the consulting, as I've said before, that we primarily engage with governments, NGOs and, and international NGOs. Uh, next slide please. So let's uh, look at some of the training that, that we offer. Uh, these are training courses that I offer. Other members of the Edinburgh Peace Institute offer different training courses. So uh, humanitarian field training. Now this is if you're going to be working as a humanitarian, uh, uh, if you're working for a humanitarian kind of organisation and you're working in, say, Syria or Iraq uh, or Myanmar, uh, where there's conflict, uh, you, you need to have the skills uh, before you actually go into the field. So because I have a medical background also, uh, I've developed this course and there are a few organisations who run this course now and we offer a pre-deployment hostile environment awareness and medical aid training and this is to prepare you to go and work for a humanitarian organisation in a conflict or a crisis setting. I also deliver UN peacekeeper pre-deployment peacekeeping training and I can do this based on my military background. I'm ex-military, ex-Royal Marines uh, so I've developed this course and we've engaged it in Egypt for the African Union. And this is primarily to train peacekeepers to take into account non-combatants and civil society and to make sure that civil society is protected uh, when they are on peacekeeping engagements. Further field based training that we are organise and develop is uh, with regards to research methods and research training regarding monitoring and, and evaluation. Now, we're happy to do a theoretical course in a classroom, but that's not what the Edinburgh Peace Institute is about. We're about getting people and taking them into the real world to give them real world practice, to practice methods on the ground uh, with real conditions. And our next field trip is engaging in Israel-Palestine. We are trying to develop that just now. But obviously, if there are students or a group of students from Edinburgh or where else, uh, they can approach us and they say, we have a team who want to go out to this conflict here and we will organise that for you. So that's something that we do. So some of the themes that we, we look at are peace education and development, uh, human needs analysis. Now, my primary engagement in the Edinburgh Peace Institute is to develop uh, human needs analysis in conflict and crisis. That's the main uh, vision and mission of the Edinburgh Peace, Peace Institute. But we also carry out health evaluation and we also evaluate uh, humanitarian interventions. So the main task of the Edinburgh Peace Institute is to be a critical actor that looks at NGOs and how they intervene. They look at, we examine and critically analyse how governments intervene and then we provide a uh, policy analysis based on their intervention, their successes and also their failures. And that's the type of training that we want to bring to people who are going to be working in the field in uh, the humanitarian sector. So some of the course design for that monitoring and evaluation course looks at uh, applying research methods, how we go about uh, designing research, how to generate empirical evidence and research questions, how we analyse the findings that we're uh, getting, how we then design a policy report and policy recommendations, and then ultimately how do we disseminate that evidence through journal articles, conferences, workshops, lectures, etc. Other training that we do provide is emergency humanitarian 
uh, inter intervention, and we primarily give that to NGOs, uh, Medicine Sans Frontières, International Red Cross, the UN, UNDP. Uh, we also provide media and training, and again, we offer our MSc ME modules to work alongside academic institutions. Uh, we are currently in discussions with uh, the University of Notre Dame in America at the moment, so we are looking to uh, develop something in collaboration with them. Uh, next slide, please. So why is peace education a focal point for my work, so for me personally? Well, when I when I did my PhD, I, I did my field work in Israel and Palestine, and I looked at four different types of interventions. These were state interventions and mediation, security interventions, and uh, protest in interventions from civil society. And the last one I looked at was peace education intervention as a, a joint uh, engagement between Israelis and Palestinians working in communities and schools. And out of the four interventions, the peace education was, was the most positive, had the, the greatest impact to transform young minds away from conflict and towards peace. So that's why peace education is a major focal point for me in, in conflict, because if we approach it properly and we deliver it properly and teach it, teach peace education properly, we can have a excellent kind of transformative uh, impact in society. So what, are, what is a protracted conflict? Well, Northern Ireland, Israel, Palestine, Myanmar, Iraq and Syria, these are all protracted conflicts that are going on in the world today. So if we're looking at education, think about how the hatred uh, that builds up over decades, how can education transform hatred? So that's really a question for the students. Think about uh, the killing, the ethnic cleansing, the genocide. What role can education play in understanding and transforming societies impacted by war? So if we're looking at a post-conflict peace building intervention, what is the role of education in changing and transforming uh, conflict societies? We may want to think about the current refugee crisis or IDPs, internally displaced persons. There's currently 9.5, I believe, 9.5 million in Syria, internally displaced people. But then we have the same in Iraq, Myanmar, and re more recently in Armenia. So how do we or they reset onto a peaceful trajectory? Can it be achieved? And what tools and pedagogies are required? So these are some of the questions. These are kind of rounded, fairly basic questions, but they are broad and they are big questions. But ultimately, pedagogy, if we ask the question, what is pedagogy and what is peace education? We, are, we can understand that pedagogy can be used uh, to create the ideological basis for conflict, but it can also be used to develop the conditions of peace. So it's a, it's a kind of, a, it's, we have to strike that balance. How do we get from war, peace to, how, how do we deliver that space? How do we find a, a settlement? Uh, next slide, slide please. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so. Ah, uh, can we go forward one, please? Next, thank you. That's fine. So what are the current peace education projects that EPI are working on just now? Well, as I've just mentioned, I engaged in uh, peace research between Israelis and Palestinians in Pal Israeli-Palestinian schools uh, during my PhD and that finished in 2014 and I have since lectured on their approach to peace education and I have a book forthcoming. Uh, you can see the link in project one, they are called the parentscircle.org uh, and I would encourage you to visit their website and look at their work. Uh, which is transformative within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and they uh, teach up to 20 to 30,000 uh, people per year and they're the only NGO 
who does not encourage people to join uh, their organisation. Now, in order to join the Parent Circle Family Forum, a member of your family uh, would have have to have uh, died or been killed during the conflict. So these people work actively to stop the violence and the killing that goes on in Israel and Palestine. So they don't want new members because to be a member, you have to have been bereaved. So their, their work is very interesting and I would say share their work, uh, look into their work and they do uh, amazing uh, teaching on the ground. A second project that we are currently uh, developing is called Teaching Genocide, build, Peace Building in Rwanda. Now this is not only teaching, but it's also action research. Now we've covered the first basis. So there's myself, uh, Dr. Liam Thompson, and then there's Mr. Joseph Butubutu, and he's a diplomat of Rwanda. So we've managed to get through the first hurdle. We've, we've connected the dots, we are connected with Rwanda, we've got access to the schools, we've got access to humanitarian camps. We are now at the stage of building the funding for the research project. And so we are looking for a, possibly an academic or another NGO collaboration uh, to bring that forward and then uh, put in a funding bid for that research. And then lastly, uh, in, a, in a recent discussion uh, for Scotland, but it could be applied wider, is we, we have a, a, a project called Securitizing Youth. Uh, now, what we are trying to do there is we are trying to uh, basically provide the youth of Scotland with some form of security through education. And we, as you know, you're living in Scotland, you're, you're aware that we have a, a quite a terrible drugs problem. There's also a problem with self-harm and young people and suicide. So we want to address these kinds of issues. So it's a, it's a project that looks at educating young people about drugs, self-harm, suicide, gang culture, knife and gun crime. Uh, and we've got a few people who are kind of pulling together a team. So this is looking like it could be a some form of edited book, uh, but we, all, we also want to develop lesson plans for teachers so that they can use them in school also. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so that's a potted kind of a very summarised version of EPI. We are building now, we are uh, growing and we should be registered in April. Uh, so we're currently a think tank and we are moving towards uh, charitable status. So we are building a new website. We're using Google at the moment. So uh, if, if there's any IT specialists out there who can help, <laughs> do, do let us know. Uh, you can email uh, the team on info at Edinburgh Peace Institute or if there's anything you want to talk about, you can email me personally at William W. Thompson, WWT at the Edinburgh Peace Institute. And I think that's it. Stay safe, look after yourself, and thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, well, well, thank you both for sharing. I think it's interesting, and uh, I'm sure we've got people on the call here that were interested, especially after uh, taking the Comparative Ed and International Development course and hearing about education and peace building specifically in that course during week eight. And so those that are taking it right now, it's something to look forward to, to see how it relates to really practices and training on the ground. So some great stuff. The next thing I'd like to do is we're going to do two different panel questions. So I'll invite one of our event planning team members to ask a question uh, to our panelists. The panelists will have just two or three minutes to kind of share their response and then we'll do a second question if you've got questions for our panelists please do add them to the chat box at this time and we'll make sure that we have a chance to get to those um, as soon as we're done with these two panel questions so great stuff from our panel presentations now i want to invite uh yung yao lee one of our event planning team members uh, to join us and ask her question uh, hi, my question is that how has the Corona-19 pandemic effect affected your work and future plans? So, thanks, Yongya. Um, 
Shelly, I know you've started some and talked a little bit about how that's affected Scottish Love in Action and the partners. Um, can you expand on that and maybe talk a little bit about the future plans that uh, SLA is? Yes, it, uh, I mean, it's a, it's uh, it's affected everything. There's just no, no way uh, that you can say that um, we we aren't affected. We're affected here in Scotland because we've had to uh, cancel all our events, which is uh, about fundraising. So we've had to find new ways of fundraising. And of course, there are new ways of fundraising that have that have turned up in this this environment. Um, we, we've also um, Actually, we've also found, perhaps interestingly, that the use of this sort of technology has increased. Um, but for us, um, uh, actually, we hadn't really probably used uh, um, Zoom or our Teams as much as we could have with our Indian partners. And now we're we are actually probably talking to them more because we are uh, we've got used to this technology and they've got used to this technology. Although there are. Uh, often problems about um, bandwidth and so on. Um, I, I, I think that um, uh, we think a lot about what, how we're going to get out of this. And we know that our NGO partners in Hyderabad think a lot about what's going to happen there. I mean, I, I remain fairly shocked that there has been the schools in, um, uh, I, I don't know whether this is the whole of India, but certainly in Hyderabad, the schools have been out since um, uh, March last year. There, there, there have been there's been very little schooling for these. Uh, I, I'm sure that the, the the richer kids are probably getting schooling, but the marginalised kids are getting very very little. I think that they the the uh, the ones who are doing public exams, which are in um, which are um, the kind of basically the equivalent of hires, um, they have been doing those, but I think they've been doing them without having any, uh, without having any education. So I don't know how that's going to work and what the impact is going to be into the future. Um, so, so I suppose, like everybody, I would say huge impact, uh, lots of learning of doing new things, but actually. I think the impact, particularly on young people, has just been terrible. And will that group recover? Uh, we do know that many of the girls who have been, who have, who would normally be in school, and 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 a lot of the schooling in India um, is in fact um, residential. And that residential schooling provides a safe space away from the uh, problems that they might otherwise be facing. And that safe space has been lost to them since last March. And that's where all these problems are occurring. And we are hearing some really pretty grim stories about what's happening to girls. But we're also, on the other hand, hearing that the girls themselves are being supportive of each other um, and are as as I've read to you, trying to stop child marriage, um, trying to do some education amongst themselves. And, and this astonishing fact that mothers who have been involved in the um, uh, in the um, WhatsApp calls have been learning things that they didn't know. The mothers of the girls listen in and the mothers are learning. So so there's it's it's very confused, very, very difficult to actually see. And I'm I don't think I can actually answer your question in terms of what's going to happen next. <laughs> I'll yeah. pass on to somebody else. So very challenging time. Uh, thanks, Sheila, for sharing. Uh, Bill, I'd like to come to you next. Um, maybe specifically, not just your work, but even in trying to construct and build a new institute in the middle of a pandemic, uh, <laughs> there might be unique challenges there. Yeah, it has. Uh, I mean, obviously for everyone, it's a, it's a global problem. Uh, I think everyone saw it coming, apart from the governments of the world, uh, <laughs> uh, ultimately. But, but there we go. We are where we are. And I think it's affected everybody. It's affected us. Uh, we were actually in transition. I, I had another, I'll type it in the chat box, actually. I had another humanitarian organisation. It was called Sector3.org. And we used to provide monitoring and evaluation training for humanitarian agencies. 
and uh, hostile environment training and crisis response training. So I have a background in that. And we were just folding that up to, to fold all that information into the Edinburgh Peace Institute but to look more about uh, engaging with human needs in conflict. So what's, what's happened is that a much of our work has, has been aligned to the online a kind of a platform, uh, but we're also providing a, a lot of actually free advice to people on crisis response, uh, safety. We've engaged with to, given advice to some uh, humanitarian agencies who are based in Turkey, but they're working in Syria, just about how how they can protect themselves and how they can protect the the communities and the in, the internally displaced people that they're they're caring for. So, but it also has had an effect on some of the work that we ge generally do, like the hostile environment training, the fight, the pre-deployment training. Uh, I was out teaching the crisis management students at the University of Leiden uh, last year. Uh, and then when COVID hit, I had to come home and we had a few courses lined up to go back to Leiden and to, we were meant to be heading out to uh, Notre Dame University and we had other uh, back out to Israel. So we had a lot of things that were in train that were impacted by COVID. So like like everyone, we're kind of, we're waiting. Uh, we're grateful to the scientists of the world uh, who are building vaccines and, and hopefully they will be able to uh, save the day and save humanity and, and hopefully we can all move forward in, in a better way. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, Philippe, I'm going to head. I know you've got a slide on this, so I'm going to move back to your slide on COVID and the Alliance. But if you want to come in and start. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, what I've done is I've looked at this because I think it's affected, impacted on the Alliance work in two ways. First of all is as an organisation and how we work. And secondly, the content, the actual work of the Alliance. <clears throat> and I think like every other organisation, pretty much um, rapid, rapid shift to remote working. I went home from work on the 13th of March, um, completely unaware that I would not be basically out of the house again, let alone back in the office. I haven't seen my colleagues since then. We've had to adapt very quickly to online modalities for um, for trainings, for meetings, for discussions, for everything we do, which we find is much more time intensive to prepare for that. And also our events have all obviously shifted online. Our annual conference, which was due to take place in September, became a digital summit rather than um, a, a conference with people together. Now, I'd, I'd like to segue into the Alliance work on that and say that that has it's been really demanding. It's been very tiring and um, it's been very difficult, but it's also brought a lot of advantages um, as well as disadvantages. The first one being, for example, at the Digital Summit and at our other roundtables and working groups, it's been so much easier to work alongside our colleagues who are based in, in, in other countries and the countries where our, our members are working. So we had a number of different speakers, for example, and contributors at the, at the Digital Summit. So the session, one of the sessions I ran on inclusion, we had um, a colleague from Rwanda, a colleague from Malawi and a colleague from Ethiopia, all able to present. And that wouldn't have been possible had it not been for COVID, which is a, a strange irony. Um, but in addition to that, we've had to draw in a lot of the work that we had planned. We've had to add in extra work. So we've had focused roundtable discussions on the impact of COVID, particularly in um, the, the Scottish partner countries, for example, um, and on specific issues and safeguarding. I think Sheila's uh, presentation on uh, the impact of COVID, uh, particularly on girls in India, has highlighted so many issues. We tend to get focused on the medical side and the impact of COVID, which is horrendous in its own right. But we're we need to see as well the social issues 
um, that are coming out, the issues on safeguarding, the massive increase in child marriages, the people whose livelihoods are absolutely destroyed without any safety nets at all, education systems which are crippled, the gains which had been made in education and in other areas of sustainable development goals that have been all but wiped out. So we've had to focus um, discussions specifically on the impact of, of COVID. In addition to that, um, I think Sheila put it very well as well that fundraising has suddenly become everything which we've taken for granted has suddenly changed. You, you can't hold events anymore in the same way. Um, you can't stand on a street corner, rattle a can, you can't hold um, a social event. So we've had to respond and adapt our training and learning uh, services so that we can support members uh, in, in issues that they're facing. Um, and that has been around fundraising, as I said, but also pivoting their programmes. There's a very fine line. We tend to talk about humanitarian work and development work as two separate areas. But if you're in one particular context, then you can't really make that division easily. If you're in um, in a country working and an emergency happens, for example, I worked in Myanmar. I lived there for, for seven years. So when a cycl cyclone came, we were well placed on the ground to be able to respond to that. So many of our members are working in places where they've had, suddenly had to pivot their programme um, and respond in an emergency context. Um, and in addition to that, there have been uh, many policy and advocacy related questions such as the cut in um, overseas overseas aid from 0.7, um, you know, advocating for that and the impact it has um, and the social impact of, uh, of different areas of, of the pandemic as well. So that's just a, a roughly a quick overview of how COVID-19 has impacted on the work of the Alliance and our members. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Philippa. So I want to now invite uh, Vivi Yang in to ask the second panel question. Hi, uh, my question is, um, can you please share your professional journey and how do you get to your um, current position with us? Excellent. Uh, thanks, Vivi. And uh, Felipe, since I've got your slides up here, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to, to get started because I know you've got sure. a story yeah, to tell. I, I realize I think I may have mixed the slides up in order a little bit, but um, this, this is the bit that really kind of gladdens my heart, if you like. Um, I was in at the tail end of the previous panel, and I think I heard Gary Dawn talk about flexibility. Um, and I think that for me has been the key thing. My career path has been a very unusual one. I didn't go to university when I left school. Um, I went into community development first um, and then uh, went into international development after going to university. So it's been a bit unusual. I didn't actually go into international development until I was 40 um, and uh, took my first overseas role in Nepal, working with BSO, uh, managing their education programme. And that was a massive learning uh, place for me. Um, the photograph on this particular slide is, is one that just makes me smile. I'm working with my colleagues in um, the Delta area of Myanmar um, and just working very, very closely with, uh, with the team that works there. The, the woman with the blue lunge on is um, from the education department. Um, so you can see how, how much working together with people was, was important to learn and understand the context and to work together rather than going in as, as an expert. Um, now the next slide which uh, talks about um, what my specific path was um, I think I may have mixed up the order a little bit. Perfect, you've got it. I'm just going to really quickly go through, not to kind of highlight my CV or anything, but really just to show that flexibility, opportunity and following your passion is really important. So after working in community development um, in the early, early to late 80s, I then gave up my job, went to university um, studying languages, so not uh, not in international development at all, really, in, in language, literature, um, and that included 
study in France and Belarus. Belarus, I was actually there just as it was transitioning to um, an independent um, country, which was, uh, looking back, an incredible time to be there. After um, a period working in international relations, I then decided that my children having grown up that I would fly the nest rather than them. And um, I took my first overseas role working as the programme manager for, for VSO in Nepal. And I ended up, I, I left Edinburgh um, one June afternoon with um, a one way ticket to Kathmandu and a three year contract. And I actually came back to Scotland 17 years later. Um, after having spent a number of years overseas, I did, of course, come back to visit, but um, I working in the education sector for all of those years. Um, just I realized how important and how much I cared and how, how much I was passionate about it. And that is the one lesson I think is focusing on something, finding out what really fires you up and that you care about. Um, so I ended up working in Nepal, as I said, for five and a half years, followed by contracts with Save the Children as an education advisor in Mongolia, which was assessing, um, reviewing, assessing and guiding their strategy, which worked with children with disabilities and nomadic children um, and preschool children. Um, I worked in India um, for a, a number of years as well on the, um, actually in the tsunami affected areas uh, before moving to Sri Lanka. Um, and that was very much in the humanitarian sector working in the education and emergencies um, area alongside UNICEF and coordinating the education uh, response during the conflict, the uh, the last years of the conflict. I then moved to Myanmar again on a two year contract and ended up staying there for seven years, working very closely with the government and the communities um, on reform of the education, the whole education system. And when I arrived in Myanmar, it was um, a very, very different scenario to what it is now. It was completely under military rule. There was absolutely, we had no idea that um, opening up and democratization was ahead of us only a couple of years from when I first arrived. Um, and the uh, work that, um, that William has talked about in terms of peace education was absolutely core to what we were talking about, the divisions and the, the hate speech and the um, challenges which were embedded, many of them in the education um, system um, were, were absolutely core to our work. So for example, the question of language of instruction, the Myanmar or Burmese majority language was the official language of instruction in Myanmar and yet many, there are 135 languages, many children speak not a single word of Myanmar. So when they go to school, they're sitting in a classroom where they don't understand a word. So we worked very closely to gently introduce the idea um, and the, the rationale that actually learning in mother tongue is very, very important for a child um, for their overall education and development, not only in literacy. Um, gosh, I could go on for that on about that for hours. I do apologise. Um, and then moving on to Rwanda, where I should have got that was the other way around. I, I went in a longer contract, but unfortunately, due to funding scenarios, um, after just over a year, um, my contract came to an end, and I returned to Scotland. So I, I feel that my heart, as well as my head, are very much in um, education, having seen and lived at first hand uh, how critical education is to every child um, in in every context but in particularly where social systems are much more fragile um, it's it's something which i i hope that um, the students here today are are also going to have the opportunity to to embrace in the way that I was fortunate enough to do. Um, so I hope that I've taken some of that back to um, the uh, the life that I have now, which is you know working with the uh, the, the alliance, um, particularly on the effectiveness and learning side, training, learning together, and with a particular interest in in safeguarding and uh, organisational growth. So my I think the key message I would draw out from that is 
be flexible. You don't need to have a, a formulaic career path. Um, mine was very, very different. And you don't know that looking forward always, but looking back as I am, as I, what I say, past my Voldemort age, which is the one where you can't say the number out loud, but you get a bus pass. Um, looking back, it all makes sense. Looking forward, I don't think I would have anticipated that, but um, I feel very, very fortunate. And I keep learning every day. There's never a day where I don't stop learning. And I never know who my teacher's going to be on a particular day. I may learn something from a child next door. I may learn something from a more formal source. So yeah, keep learning and uh, keep your heart in it as well as your head. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Julia. Or sorry, sorry thanks, Philippe, <laughs> uh, for, for sharing what is quite a journey that you've went on uh, in multiple countries. Interesting stuff. Uh, Shelly, I was hoping you can come in and talk a little bit about your career, career path, but also talk a little bit about what a trustee is. Um, yes. A little more. Um, uh, so, so, so in fact, my career path is 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 very different because I am retired. Um, I I retired as director of the university library in Edinburgh University uh, some years ago. I don't think I need to go into how many. Um, and um, I, I my. Um, uh, so my whole my whole professional career was actually as a librarian uh, within the university. I, I I don't want to hear from any students at the moment about problems with their library service. Um, the um, I, I I when I retired, I was kind of casting around for things that things to do and actually I got involved with Scottish Love and Action almost by chance. But it has been just the most incredible journey for me uh, in my retirement to become a trustee for, for Scottish Love and Action. And um, the, what I've done for Scottish Love and Action was that I led the project uh, to find the new, uh, to find the new project action to support um, in uh, around about 2016-17 um, when they wanted to have some new projects. And um, actually the interesting thing was that I brought quite a lot of the skills that I had had uh, from my time in the university to doing that uh, to doing that work, um, uh, and uh, I, I would say that um, a, a sort of understanding research, um, the politics of the university um, probably was quite important. Um, I, I, my work. Uh, at the university had been all about networking and flexibility and about educate and about valuing education so i brought all of those things into into uh, looking for these projects in hyderabad and i feel very close to to these projects in Hyderabad now, um, having um, been um, seen seen them over a number of years, and now uh, they are very core now to Scottish Love and Action's work. So, so I'm both a volunteer and a trustee, if that makes sense. I, I volunteer for the organisation and do um, quite a lot of work for the organisation now, particularly actually in fundraising, uh, when I can write with some passion about the uh, what I've seen. Of of the projects in India, um, uh, which is, I think it's important when you're applying for funding that you actually believe in what you're what you're doing. Uh, like Philippa, I think that learning every day is very, very important. Um, and I really feel that I do, still do that. Uh, as to being a trustee, um, uh, tr uh, trustees are, 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 are interesting um, because some trustees, I think, actually uh, are, are quite um, they they will sit back and observe what's going on and will only in, uh, come in whenever there's particular expertise that they have that is is, is important. Uh, but as a collectively, the group of trustees have the responsibility to ensure that the organisation is well run uh, with the staff, um, uh, with appointing staff, with uh, and with ensuring that the financial situation is okay. But actually the trustees also have to feel that passion about what, what you're doing. Um, I, th I think that it's probably fair to say, and Philippa probably would know better than me, um, that, um, that most trustees in um, Scottish um, uh, international development organizations will be, uh, will be older and that actually we could benefit from having younger people in 
in, in, in trustee roles. Um, and, and, and actually, for people who are studying international development or education, the, the whole notion of actually getting involved with a with with a Scottish or a, an, another organisation, international development organisation, is is probably a way of finding out how the world works. Um, I, so um, I I would advocate. Um, I'm sure Philippa has ways of of of, of finding um, uh, uh, organisations that. Um, are looking for trustees, um, and uh, I would just say that it's actually a good thing for somebody who's younger to do because they will bring a different aspect to it to the group of trustees, um, and that's always essential. Um, I hope that's answered your question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Julia. It's it's interesting thinking about a different opportunity to not just contribute to an organization, but also learn from it, learn the kind of networks around it and how the international development world works. Um, so excellent stuff. Uh, Bills, I know you've got also a very interesting uh, career journey. Can you share some of yours with us? Uh, hi, yeah, I can. I'll, I'll uh, my career. Uh, in the, it's a very summarised one. I will give you my kind of academic personal website. Yeah, so you can have a look at that. But ultimately, uh, I started my career in the military. <coughs> Excuse me. Started my career in the military and I worked in mine clearance and I was also a qualified uh, combat medical paramedic. Uh, so these were the two main skills uh, that I that I have, and then I I left the military. Excuse me. Uh, I, I I ended up uh, leave, leaving the military, and I went into uh, work as a medic for a number of years. I I, I then went into uh, crisis intervention. And I developed a company where I was providing consultancy on disaster disaster management and medical uh, trauma. Excuse me, my throat's a bit dry. I'm just going to drink a water. <coughs> yeah, so I, I went on to kind of uh, disaster management consultancy, and I did that for about a uh, ten to fifteen years. <coughs> and during that period, I actually used that business to kickstart my PhD. But ultimately, it was my experience of conflict when I was younger that kind of set me on that path and trajectory towards uh, peace and human needs and to try and understand conflict. And uh, one of the main things that I keep arguing about and talking to people about <coughs> Excuse me. Is uh, when when you work in a conflict. I mean, you are part of the conflict kind of dynamic. But when you're maybe a peacekeeper or a peace activist, and you're not uh, you're not an Israeli or you're not a Palestinian, or you're not a Catholic or you're not a Protestant, you're you're in the conflict, but you're standing on the outside, and. I'm a great believer that when you when you work for peace, it's not about taking a side. It's about standing on the outside and not being a part of the conflict and trying to help those who are in conflict move towards a better place. And, and one of the things I've realised is when you are standing on the outside of the conflict and you're not part of it, you are actually standing in a place of peace. So it's really about bringing them towards you. Uh, uh, in order to help them uh, see it from a different angle. So, uh, so my traject uh, kind of career trajectory has been uh, pretty much informed by my experience in the military, but I've also kind of moved that forward and kind of built on that. So uh, I have kind of 25, 30 years of conflict and crisis intervention experience. So I mean, I did come to academia later in life. I was uh, 30 and I spent the next kind of 10, 12 years doing a, a degree, a master's degree, then a PhD. <coughs> and then I went on to lecture uh, 
at different universities. I lectured at Glasgow in 2015-16 uh, on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, I then moved to back to St Andrews. So I lectured at the University of St Andrews in uh, security and human security on the MLIT. I then got a, a, a one year contract down at the University of Manchester in the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute, where I, if you look at my profile and the teaching that I did there, uh, yes, it was very interesting. <laughs> it was a very busy year. Uh, but I think one of the things that I was able to bring to that role, and it was a, a wonderful role, I mean, it's a pity that it was only a one year contract because it was the perfect balance of uh, conflict, peace building and humanitarian intervention. Uh, but it was a very, very busy, uh, very busy time. But one of the things I realised, and probably a very interesting point for the students, is that uh, I had this wealth of experience behind me from the medical side, from the, the military, experience in conflict, working in conflict, working in, in crisis. And uh, obviously the, the, the academic background as well, the PhD, the master's degree in research. So all that kind of helped to kind of uh, make me a more kind of rounded kind of academic and a more mature academic when I was standing in front of young people and teaching them. Because I had that experience, I had that weight behind me to actually teach people. So, so yeah, I mean, trajectory is everything. And I think I would say to the younger people out there, if you are finishing a master's degree or an undergrad or even a PhD, uh, and tr try and get some real world practical engagement where you're dealing with society and people and then come back to the academic uh, question and then and, and put, put all these skills into your work. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, uh, one of my arguments is that academia needs to engage with the real world, not from behind the desk, but actually in the world. So there needs to be this real academic theory practitioner engagement. And that's something that I really try to push. So that's that's my traje traje trajectory and summary. <laughs> and uh, I now kind of at the stage where I'm looking to bring this theory and practice together into in the Edinburgh Peace Institute. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank Sorry you, for Will. coffee. <laughs> no, no, I just um, Yeah. So. I think one of the big takeaways from from our three kind of career paths is that there's not a direct line into this work, but there's kind of an underlying passion that drives people towards their end. Um, and, and I think Philippe's conversation that it almost makes a lot of sense when you look backwards that, oh, these all relate and they all are together because there's this drive that you have, um, you know, whether it's girls education or whether it's peace education or whatever it is that that does bring all this together but you can't always see where you're moving in the future so thanks very much for sharing the variety of ways we can get involved here uh, the other big takeaway for me is that you know if you are thinking about something in development that that could be something that is an underlying idea that turns that you turn to maybe a little later in your career as well as an opportunity. So what you're starting now doesn't mean that this is what you may be doing for the rest of your life. There's lots of opportunities um, to kind of follow your own path. So I want to, I know we've got, um, let's say about 10 minutes for questions. If you've got questions, please do add them to the chat box. Um, and Chun, I know we've got a question, I think from Laura. Can you share Laura's question with us? Sure. Um... I'm not sure if um, she's asking about COVID, but um, she did put forward a point that um, how safe is nowadays to work on humanitarian fields? And um, would it be possible to do a placement-based dissertation in NPI? Okay, so Bill, I think that's uh, pretty broad, but COVID and otherwise, when you think about the safety in working in humanitarian fields, can you talk more for people that haven't been uh, in the fields, what are some of the safety concerns? I can I can put the camera on now because we're we've got good internet connection. Uh, 
I do have a link actually here for that question, which will help answer the question for you. Uh, do, do, do. Give me two seconds. Yeah. Copy. Okay. Right, so paste and go. OK, this is a UN OCHA. And they have developed a report on uh, humanitarian security and safety. So for the person asking the question, this will be very much down your street. If you move to page five, you can see the type of issues and problems that humanitarians uh, come up against. Uh, suicide bombing, kidnapping, armed raids, collateral violence, improvised explosive devices, uh, common crime, carjacking, sexual violence and landmines. Uh, that's in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Somalia. Uh, in the DRC, Chad and Sudan in Africa. Yep, very similar issues and problems there. So this is why we organise training for humanitarians before they actually go out into the field uh, to, to provide them with the skills in order to try and read the situation that they're in. So the question was, uh, so that's that's one example of the safety. Uh, can you undertake a possible placement, a placement based dissertation? Uh, yeah, I mean, we encourage uh, students to work with us. Uh, you would have to talk to your faculty and then your advisor. And if it's Will, Will would then have to talk to me. We would have to look at uh, how we could engage that, especially at the moment due to COVID. Uh, so we wouldn't be able to say, I don't think the university would allow you to, to go running off into a, a conflict zone to carry out a peace, peace work or peace evaluation or a, an evaluation of a humanitarian organisation doing development work in, in Syria or Iraq uh, during COVID. So you may have to think about it uh, how you want to do that. It may have to be a, a desk based uh, research project and maybe that's something we could work together on to help you. We could assist with in order to turn it into a, a project later on down the line uh, to ask questions. But we would certainly be able to help and assist uh, some of the students and and put their information out there and connect them up with the humanitarian organisations that we all, all, all already know. Yeah, so yeah, that's the short answer. Thanks, thanks for sharing. Um, okay. Since we're on sharing potential student opportunities, I wanted to come to Felipe because I know you've created a slide that I'm going to bring up in a bit on how we can engage a little bit with the Alliance, not just for students, but I think a little bit of everybody. Um, so, so hoping you can share out what we've got here on this slide. So yep, absolutely. Started. Excellent. Here we go. Great. Um, and, and just to pick up on uh, Sheila's um, point earlier on about uh, becoming a trustee, the Alliance does have a, a jobs page on it, and that very often does feature um, organisations looking for trustees. The, as the Alliance ourselves, we actually at our AGM in December, we um, appointed our first trustee who's under 30, which is a real, we're really looking forward to having her perspective um, on, on work. So there's definitely a move and an interest in changing the profile um, of trustees and organisations and making it more more representative. Um, as, as Sheila says, it very often is uh, people who find that they've got more time later on and towards retirement. So very keen to encourage that. But as, in terms of the alliance and opportunities to engage with us, um, you know, similarly, we uh, are open to hearing about research placements um, for, for students, and those could be um, a placement based dissertation. Obviously, in COVID times, it would no longer be physically in the Alliance at the moment. But uh, for example, on mapping Scotland's organisations working overseas, on mapping the, um, the work of organisations according to the SDG 
goals. Um, so there can be a number of different things. We've also been developing a PCSD wiki. Now, if anybody can say what PCSD is, you get a, a prize. Um, it's policy coherence for sustainable development. Um, and that's it's a, a critical area of ensuring that all areas of policy kind of speak to each other and are, are at least consistent and um, don't contradict each other. So education policy, social policy, economic policies should all be coherent. Um, so there's an opportunity to engage in that. Um, uh, in terms of the policy work, um, there can be opportunities to work alongside our policy um, officer to look at current issues that uh, that are coming up. Um, there is likely to be considerable work. Well, we know there'll be considerable work around COP26 um, and, for example, public engagement in the run up to COP26 could be an interesting opportunity to, to engage with us. And also uh, on the comms side, um, looking at, you know, things like blog posts, editing, update, updating the website and areas like that as well. So we're certainly very open to to hearing about what options they may look differently in the COVID world, but uh, certainly for the time being. But uh, we're, we're very keen on engaging and hearing about ideas, areas of interest and to chat, ch chat with our colleagues. Um, just a small caveat that I did mention that we are a tiny team. There are seven of us and our policy and advocacy um, and Kong's um, colleague is about to go on maternity leave any minute. Um, so <laughs> we'll not be around for the next month, but uh, that doesn't mean that we can't we can't look at questions you might have. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for sharing. And so I will be sharing out this PowerPoint um, and the video as well as well as hopefully other opportunities for audience members to engage with these organizations uh, sometimes following this presentation. Uh, as we're just about out of time here, I'd like to give our panelists one last opportunity. I think most of our audience here are uh, kind of in the graduate or uh, master's level piece and are just kind of here to hear about what it means to work in this field. Is there any final piece of advice for individuals that are are playing around, whether it's what skills they need or, you know, uh, experiential opportunities, any final bits of advice for our audience members? Um, Shelly, can we start with you on this one? I, I think Philippa summed it up earlier when saying keep learning every day. Um, I, I, I think that's um, there. Take the opportunities that there are um, and uh, just think about um, how you what your particular skills can can allow you to do to help people who are in a less privileged position than you. That's all I can say. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, Bill, any final thoughts? Advice? Oh, uh, work hard, uh, believe in yourself, believe in the cause that you're working for. Uh, yeah, just keep just keep striving and try to marry together the, the practical side of life and the, the academic and kind of bring them together. <laughs> and try and have some kind of impact on, on the work that you do, you know, so yeah. Keep Excellent. Going. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Philippa? Yeah, I, I think I keep harking back to always be open to learning and I think alongside that, listen, I think we go in very often. I, my job title was um, education advisor for many of my roles, but I, the most important thing I needed to do was to listen and to understand and find solutions together. So maintain that curiosity, be open to learning, listen, and finally be humble um, because we are all, we're all the same when it all boils down to it. Um, so be humble and listen and, um, uh, yeah, be open to learning, I think, are the, the key things that I would say. Excellent. All right, well, thank you for the last bit of advice for everybody here. I want to give a final thank you to our panelists. So thank you, Philippa, Shelia, and Bill for joining us uh, on the second panel. I also want to thank the CID event planning team for helping me put this together. That includes uh, Linji and Chuyi, who put together the event flyer. flyer. Uh, Young Yao and Vivi were 
asking our panel questions, and Jun, who is moderating in the chat box. So if you want to know more about the CID community, you can follow us at Moray House CID on Twitter, or check out our new research group. Um, we have over 50 faculty from across the university that are engaging in issues in education international development. So I'm hoping to, as Bill focused on providing a breakdown between academic and the real the practitioners, so we're not living in an academic silo here. We want to make sure that we've got this engagement across fields. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, really great stuff, um, and I will be in touch with everyone in the future. So thanks. I hope you have a great day and wonderful weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.